What's up, everybody? How is it going? I am Brandon Kling. This is Zach Gura. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm not going to lie. feels good to be back on camera. It's the good. Prodigal to, Son returns. Good to have you back. It's been, you You haven't been here in a while. I haven't seen you in a while. No, I haven't. It's been, been sad. Here in a while. And then I've been away from like my phone for a while as well because I've been doing a billion things. Work. Work is busy. Work ties us all up. Yep. It's a little crazy. It's all good though. Um, so this is a brand new podcast that we will be doing bi-weekly yeah. on Saturday mornings. This is the first one that's going up and the podcast has a name. We've crescent it. Brandon, what is it? What do this we call is this? Podcast Independent. So Independent, if you can't figure it out by the name, this is where we're going to solely be talking about, mainly about indie games. Um, last Fat Chat, we had a question, you know, how does one look at an indie game? What is it classified as? We're not here to tell you how that works. <laughs> no, 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 no. We will all. talk about indie games in general. Uh, we will talk about a lot of stuff too. Um, but overall, should be pretty good. Should be a lot of fun. So I don't I, see why not. I like this because it'll be a little bit more of a broad spectrum. Um, of course, we're not just going to talk about uh, you know the strict definition of indie games. You are going to talk about a lot of those third party. Smaller games uh, like Child of Light, stuff like that. Uh, you know, those games that really have that indie feel. Uh, really, we're trying to just talk about things that are different, people pushing the boundaries uh, with a smaller budget. So I think that's where this is going to really, really be cool. But um, so, like you said, this is podcast independent. It will go at bi weekly. This is brought to you by, of course, Fat Island Gaming, the best place to hang out during the week. Because honestly, we have streams going on every single day. Every single day and most of the night, if I can commit. That's correct. Honestly, <laughs> it's even it's gotten to the point where we're streaming even more than once per day. So we've got uh, the Fat Chat, which of course goes up Monday nights at 10, which are always great. That's where the four of us sit down and we all yell and scream at each other. Then we do streams throughout the week, normally starting about 8 or 9 o'clock. We, and then Zach, Zach streams at like 1 o'clock in the morning, super late. Yeah. It's crazy. Pacific Standard. Pacific Standard Time. Which is late. Which is late. Super really late. crazy. I, like get, I get like no sleep. I'm all right with yeah. it though, half the time. It's cool. N not much of us do get sleep, but I haven't seen you in a while, Zach. It has been a bit. Um, I've been telling everybody that like Brandon's responses, because he's been so busy, has been pretty much uh, the equivalent of an eight ball response. You could take all the answers I've been getting for this gentleman, put them into a ball and shake it, and I'd get the same response, guaranteed. It'd be probably pretty accurate to our actual conversations too. As long as three sides of the little uh, answer ball in the middle just was the word, word. Because that's how I respond to a lot of things. Just like, word. Um, I think it's a good answer. I think it gets my my feelings across really well. I don't have feelings. Well, we're, we're here to bring them back. Hopefully. Yeah. If not, we'll find a third party to do it. It'll be all right. It's true. Let's we'll, do it. We'll outsource it. Um, so first thing we kind of want to kick off, after all, this after is a new all. podcast. It is. Where do we want to start? I think since uh, this, this will kind of cover two boats. One, I haven't seen you in a while. It has been a little two, bit. Two, it'll be relevant to the podcast. What have you been playing? Everything. Yeah. I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. No, uh, on stream has been really good. Um, Hyperlight Drifter. Yeah. Uh, by Heart Machines. Beautiful, beautiful game. Uh, I know you've been playing it too. God, so much. I finally beat it though. I don't want to go too much into it. We'll talk a little bit here in a second. I've been playing that. Um, I've been playing Fury. Cool. Uh, which was Very another cool. uh, indie game that came out. That one was free on PS Plus. Yeah. Um, had that not happened, I probably would have never knew about it. But that game alone, probably one of the most challenging and fun like action puzzle solver like I've ever played. Um, so that's that's been a shitload of fun. And then before that, the reason I'm wearing the shirt, yeah. Rebel Galaxy uh, finally went free to play on PlayStation Plus. But I bought it as soon as it came out because I saw these guys at a PlayStation Experience of 2014, so the first one. And I got to sit down and talk with the dev and get hands on with the game before it came out. And yeah, I game was totally worth twenty bucks to me. They haven't announced uh, PlayStation Experience this year, have they? No, I didn't think so. I was, no, gonna, I was about to look it up, but no, I don't think they have no. either. I think. I mean, they could, but no, they I haven't. mean, I haven't seen anything. Also, too, guys, if you see us like typing away at stuff and double checking everything. There is no studio here today. Yeah. It is literally me and Brandon in this room. We're trying to run everything, facilitate all questions and answers. And we really don't have segments or anything else planned yet because this thing is so new. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it really it really is. So he's got his uh, tablet over there. I've got my laptop. So like, yeah, we're just honestly, his tablet, not mine. We're, we're really just facilitating everything from right here. We've got no. So if everything's crashing and burning, please let us know in the chat. We are watching the chat best so, as we can. So like, let us know, because if not, things are going to crash and burn. And we're going to have no idea. And it's going to be a little it's going to be a little fun too. why everything just kind of goes into a ball of flame. So sure. I really can't. Uh, 
really can't complain too much. Really can't. But I've also been playing Hyper Light Drifter. I am thoroughly enjoying it. I'm I'm not through it yet, but it's mainly because I've been streaming it. Mm-hmm. I've had a lot of people who've been actually following me from the very beginning of the stream, so I haven't been playing when I'm not streaming. Right. You've only been. It's the same thing with me too. Like I didn't facilitate this game at all unless it was on stream. Hey, what's going on, Zombie Princess? Good to see that you made it. Woo. Um, but no, the, the game's been really good, man. So like the art style and everything else that came out with, and I know Beautiful. he was um, the the main guy, the whole reason Heart Machine exists is uh, Alex Preston, right? Yeah. So we gave him a shout out on Fat Chat. But that we really was a while ago. Yeah, well, it was last episode, actually. Yeah, it was, huh? Last episode. Yeah, they so all just kind of like fall into one. I guess me. when you host everything and yeah, true. your body becomes a host machine, you got nothing else to do with it other than that. Um... No, so, I mean, the whole point of that, right? So, with Alex Preston, the reason this game is so beautiful and the reason it is so good on so many levels, besides just the art and the gameplay, is probably how it came to fruition, right? Yeah. Because we didn't talk about that on Fat Chat, and that was a little disappointing. So, Alex Preston, right? If anybody wants to look him up or see what's going on, hey, Waz, I miss you. Um, Alex Preston, unfortunately, has a uh, heart condition, right? So he's not doing so hot, um, and you know he's been with this condition for a while. Yeah. Um, when he was growing up, he would play video games. It was like his outlet. Um, even right now, he did like this really cool short video, which you could actually find on YouTube. It's like seven minutes long. He talks about the production of a uh, Hyperlight Drifter, and he, you know, he's saying he's surprised he made it past thirty. He didn't think it would make it that far. So the whole point with Hyperlight Drifter is your main character is sick, um, and he'll like throw up pixelated blood it'll kind of like deteriorate and it'll happen in like weird instances but he's trying to find a cure the whole time that's the reason he's going through and just wrecking up on mobs and like trying to discover stuff so something happens you try to find a cure and it's very close to alex preston in general um so that's why this game plays a very well like overall just everything it's just kind it has of a good tone it has a good yeah. presence the storytelling there is no script is solely done by little pictures, so, oh, so it's left up to the player to interpret. And this game can be interpreted in so many ways. And then every time you, so many ways, every time you complete like a, a section of the world, it actually goes into like a little cutscene, basically of your main character, maybe having a flashback or he's uh, stifling from the disease. There we go. So he's having a he's having a hard time trying to stick around with all this other stuff going on, and but he's still fighting. He's still getting Correct. over it the whole yeah. time. And the gameplay with Hyper Light Drifter 2, it's a lot of fun because um, uh, it's like it's like if Zelda never transitioned to 3D, right? Yeah, it's definitely. like if Zelda just kept improving on like its 2D standards, like this is probably what it would have been really close to. Yeah, I like the 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 combo between like so in the game you have a sword is going to be your main weapon, and then you also have a gun. And your gun, you actually upgrade throughout the game. You can buy new attacks and stuff for your sword. But the way you you string those together to fight is actually probably my favorite thing so the game is beautiful it's got terrific just graphics everything like that but honestly like the game play running through i feel like uh christian bale from equilibrium <laughs> like, i just feel like a total badass <laughs> i like run up chop somebody up with a sword jump out of there just blow them away with my gun it's it's really cool it's really fast paced but no it's true it's like if zelda had went a darker route and stayed 2d that's what we would have gotten we would have gotten hyper light drifter but then on top of that i have also been playing severed yeah, so tell me, okay, so you and Peter both have Correct. played Severed. Yeah. I've played a lot of their games in the past, because this is from Drinkbox Studios. Drinkbox. So they did, uh, like, Guacamelee. Guacamelee. Yeah, they, they've done a few others, They did too. another one, too. Pull that up, because there's, like, some blob game that I haven't played that I heard's really good by theirs, too. Yeah, God, what is it fucking called? Um, Just look at their shit. I'm it's sure like it's Blob like right Attack there. or something like that. Let me see. Let me pull it up. Also, too, on this podcast. Tales from Space, Mutant Blobs Attack. There we go, Mutant Blobs Attack. So, yeah. um... I heard that was really good. I haven't played it, though. Um, I think that was also a free game. Maybe on Vita. Might have been a long time ago. I probably don't have it now. I'm trying to think. Way too long at a rotation. Yeah, I'm trying to think because I know... I feel like I've seen that game before. I think I've downloaded it but never played it. I know Sever, I definitely didn't play it. That's for sure. Sever does play a lot different compared to their other games that we know about because Guacamelee was like... uh, People viewed it as like a Metroidvania yeah, yeah. Right. Definitely. Side scrolling up, down, left, right. It's got to beat certain bosses to progress, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, and then you have, I don't, I, like I said, I didn't play the Blom games. So I really don't know what that's all about. Yeah. 
But then, uh, so, then you have this one. So Severed, uh, pretty much. So I play on the Vita. Mm -hmm. It's also on iOS currently, and then it's, I believe it's coming to PS. Because it's got touch controls, right? It's all touch controls. Okay. That's pretty much the whole game. So uh, I, I don't want to give away too much of the story, but basically the, the main character, you're a female, and she's lost an arm. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of cool, first off, because you play the whole game swiping. Because it's cool so to you, lose an arm. Well, no, you play with one arm. <laughs> So if you think about oh, it, oh, I get you. Yeah. Oh. yeah, so like you're you're, you're swiping that, with one finger. I would have never. I think even if I played the game, yeah, I still wouldn't have figured that out. I'd been like, what the hell am I only? Yeah. Ah. So so you're swiping with one hand. Obviously, you're you're moving with the other hand. Mm -hmm. So you're obviously you're playing with one arm. So you're right. playing just like your main character is. And at, at first, it feels really simple. Uh, you would almost compare it to like Fruit Ninja at first, just kind of swiping at your screen to kill enemies. Okay, which doesn't do the game any justice because as you get further in the game the you get so many different enemies so you have to attack in different styles you really have to use your swipes really just really smart then eventually you start fighting multiple enemies so i've gotten to a point where i think at one point i had to fight like eight enemies at one time so then oh at the God. bottom of the screen they all have like little attack meters when it fills up they attack so you have to kind of balance attacking them turning over blocking their attack or some of them actually have ways you can hit them to lower their attack meter. So it's all just a balancing game. The The way you move through the game, because it is like an action-adventure game, the way you move through it's a little bit weird. It's just kind of press forward to move forward, turn left, and you just kind of move room to room. Watching it seems a little bit weird, and it definitely seems funky, but once you get playing, it, it feels really good, especially because you can kind of see where the enemies are, so you can kind of dance mm -hmm. around them if you want. You can go straight into attacks, depending on where your life is. There's lots of secrets. The game's absolutely phenomenal. But it's all played from a first-person perspective, first person, right? Yes, that correct. reminds me so much of like uh, old dungeon crawlers. Like, do you remember that old dungeon crawler yep. RPGs where like you would never see your character attacking, you would just see the monsters yep. and then the animations that correct. you would do for correct. your moves. So th I like that, right? Because a lot of people have kind of steered away for that for gameplay, mm -hmm. but it's it's always up to these indie developers, right? That thing a little bit outside the box that gets you to go out and experience something new. Yeah, 100%. and that's and that's the whole reason too why we're here, right? Because this is why we were talking about it. We were out at um, E3, yep, and we were starting to talk about like all these other games that were out there that weren't as big on the floor, and we were looking it up. We were just googling it, and we're just like. You know, where can somebody go to like find out and like talk about indies if people are really into them? Um, you got forums and other stuff like that, and you've got like little podcasts that maybe do like an episode a month, but yeah. like nothing, there's nothing good, there's yeah. nothing core. Nobody brings these people on their shows. Nobody like talks to any of the fans that's or community. Like, that's like our biggest thing. So like the first interview we ever did here at Fat Island Gaming with somebody big was actually uh, Yacht Club Games. Mm -hmm. which of course did Shovel Knight. So when I played that game, I just immediately fell in love with it. The game's I think so... Every, I think everybody did. It was I like the whole so. world was yeah. swept over for Correct. the most part. And people that haven't played it... Get on your shit. I give you this look every time yeah. that we talk. Seriously. I don't appreciate that. But they were the first people that we ever did an interview with. And for me, it was super special because it wasn't like just this big name who's just doing the interview for like extra like notoriety. Right. It wasn't somebody who was just like, oh, like you hit me up, fuck it, I'll do it just so you stop annoying me. They got back to me <laughs> right away. I still chat with them now, which is really cool. Um, mm -hmm. and just kind of like talk to them like the, just, like their people. And that's the thing is like all these games that they put out are like a true labor of love. So to sit down and actually talk to them, I mean, recently we just did um, Compulsion Games. Right. Once again, like these smaller, you know, these smaller titles where these people, it, it, just hearing them talk about their game too, you see how much they love and just how passionate they are. It's so fucking crazy. And the other thing with that too is like we've done another interview as well, but that one was on text and we transitioned off text interviews into just video. Correct. Which has worked better for us. I mean, overall, I think yeah. people enjoy that a lot more. Um, but They're I get more to fun sit, for me too, honestly. Right. I like and I get to sit down with um, Doug from Limited Run Games yeah. and uh, White Rabbit Studio that did Saturday Morning RPG, which I really liked and did a breakdown on. Um, so that that kind of stuff too, right? So like these people are, are much more easier to reach. Um, they obviously all love what they do and they take the time with us. None of it's sponsored or endorsed or anything like that, which is really cool with us anyways because we have that kind of relationship with these people. Yeah. Some of them will probably bring back. I'd like to get Doug or Limited Run back oh, yeah. on and I think, do a segment uh, with them again. I think Yacht Club would probably, I, I mean, probably not in person just because none of them live anywhere near I us. I know, right? We'd um, probably do another Skype call. But yeah, I mean, it'd be it'd be great to get some people on to, to do some Skype calls and hang out with us and maybe just talk a little bit more about their games, especially considering a lot of these games, they don't just come out and they don't go stale. If you That's think true. Shovel Knight, they've been cranking out DLC this entire year for this game. They're just nonstop. So it's been great. No one stops. No one stops. No one stops. And then I'm really excited because with the success they've had from this game, I'd love to see a new game from Yacht Club. 
I, I would too. And right now they're doing that whole um, free DLC thing, yeah. which I like. Um, but a lot of people, man, like they just, um, it's weird. Now it's become like this new thing, right? So like there's a conversation in the indie world right now where it's like, is freeware the best wear, right? So Answers free, yes. free I, I think so. So free updates and everything like that. I think so because it does a few things, right? That rolls your game over to the front page again. Yep. Um, that gets people revitalized about your title. Yep. And it's like, and if your title was good to begin with, people probably want more time in that world. And it's like Shovel Knight was pretty long for what it was, it too. It was definitely, yeah, for a $20, $20 game. Yeah, yeah, no, it was perfect. Um, I think I paid 24 regardless. It was Did you buy a physical? I bought, no, I bought digital. I just don't think it was on sale or price change. I don't yet. think that game has ever gone on sale. I think it did once. Once so far. Really? Once so far. Yeah, because I, I was like, price, I've, I've been trying to pay attention to that, and I've never seen that game drop onto sale, yeah, which is no, perfect. It's really good. So, um, good. so like, they've already done Plague Knight um, DLC yeah. for it, and that got me hooked again because I was like, oh, I went through and beat it. Now you get to go through the world again as Plague Knight yep. and try to do it a different way than what he Shovel was, Knight did. He was my favorite um, enemy as well. No, Specter Knight. I take that back. Specter, Specter Knight. Knight. And he's awesome. another DLC, right? Correct. So Specter Correct. Knight. I'm starting to notice what they're doing. They're paying, playing, they're paying attention to just your fan favorites. Correct. Yeah, they're so seeing they went what Plague they're... Knight, and then they're like, "What is Brandon like today? We're gonna exactly we're gonna do this guy today. We're gonna yeah. do this one because they know how awesome I am, and they were like, "Well, if we just appeal to him, he'll keep talking about our game." And then Yacht true. Club also revealed the new God of it's War true. title before anybody else. Yeah, and it was hidden so the good. whole time in their goddamn game, uh, just stuck in there. Nobody had any idea. The pain. The it, pain and suffering that I've longed for. It this. blows me away how how good of a relationship they've created with like everybody across the board. So they did. We we just said God of War. So they obviously had Kratos in the game for PlayStation, right? Which was great. Then for Wii, for Nintendo, they made an amiibo, which had its own. The amiibo actually unlocked a whole new game mode where it, it was, was like co-op, co-op, right? Which That's, is crazy because yeah. I'm still waiting for that on mine. I would right. love it so bad. Even if I don't get an amiibo, I'd, yeah. I'd still I mean, want we, it. we bought the amiibo. It's sitting here on the shelf. Yeah. I don't own the game for the week. I own the game on my Vita and my PS4, but nothing, but I no. That's it. But I wanted the amiibo and I just wanted to support. Plus it's a bitch ass. Amiibo. I was saying the, the amiibo is really nice. Like yeah. I can't complain from that too. And the guys are really cool too. Cause I get to meet some of them in person. First PlayStation experience. They had a big ass yeah. booth at the end of the indie section, yep. which was really cool. Um, so let's see. We got Hyperlight Drifter. We've been playing a shitload of. Terrific. Um, you were playing. Severed. Severed. You've been playing Rebel Galaxy. Rebel Galaxy, right? Yeah. So I'm wearing the shirt. Yeah. That's, that's actually what my, reminded me. So Boom. Wearing the right? shirt. So these guys are really cool too because I don't think a lot of people know what's going on with Rebel Galaxy. Um, I picked it up. I'm going to sound like a hipster for a minute. I'm so sorry. Uh, before it was cool? I picked it up before it was free on PlayStation Plus, uh, which it is this month. Everybody, I'm really happy, is uh, liking the game a lot. I've seen a lot of positive attention towards it, as it rightfully deserves. Yeah. Um, but the, the game is done by... Um, I have it pulled up here because I can never remember things off the top of my head. I've got it by uh, Double Damage Games, right? That was founded in 2014 by Travis Baldry and Eric Schaefer, right? So history on these two, because a lot of people will probably think of the names and probably start to remember. They're the co-founders of uh, Runic Games. Wow. So do you know who Runic Games did? I can't think of it offhand. But okay, the name... so Torchlight and then Torchlight 2, which were like huge on PC. Okay. Maybe I'm thinking of something else because those don't ring a bell. So it was really good. Yeah. Um, but when it came out to PC, right, a lot of people um, love Torchlight. Obviously, they got a second one. Um, but I can't remember if I talked to Travis or I talked to Eric because this doesn't have any photos. Oh, great, great. Um, but he gave us a shirt. Uh, me and my wife gave us the shirts and had a lot of fun with the guy. Got to play his game hands on there. He had like the best explanation for it. It was like Assassin's Creed 4's ship battles, but in space without the waves, obviously. Yeah. Um, and that's exactly what it is, right? So look to your, you know, sides, look to the front, look to the back, and then you've got like your little grid of like where you're attacking and everything. Then you've got customizations to your ship. You have places where you can dock. You are always in your ship. Um, there's no walking or anything like that. So you're always constantly being your own captain to your vessel, which Very is great. Cool whole bunch of different ships you can pilot to everything from like a big carrier to like the small little fighter ships and everything's on a 2d plane like there's no third dimension to it moving up and down okay. it's constantly just coasting aside so very much like assassin's creed boat warfare right yeah, a lot Always like you're aside. in an ocean just exactly. without, the, without the exactly. being tossed around and you know ships have different pivoting yep. a big ass ship can't turn on a dime all sorts of stuff it's really cool i love the game um and it's also got a good story element to it most of it's voice acted Good stuff. Um, but with these guys too, so the reason that one of them left, he told me, and started this game 
is because he was kind of over the medieval renaissance kind of theme to his games that he were having. Done with fantasy and wants to move to sci-fi. Exactly, exactly. So, like, instead of, like, equipping swords and everything else, too. Yeah, Torchlight is pretty good, Spicy. I'm not going to lie. Torchlight, okay. I'm not going to lie. We're trying to do, like I said, manage everything. So, if we're a little bit slacked up on the chat. Blame Zach. You can blame me. I got it here in front of me. It's Zach's I got my news. I got my chat over there. All right, well... Spice Pink Tacos never lied to me before. You have. But he does talk to menus at fast food places. It's okay. We all do. <laughs> don't, <laughs> not not don't, me. Don't act like you haven't done that. I don't talk to don't, menus yet. I mean, I, I could get there. I believe you. I'll try it out because of you, Taco, not because of Zach. Oh, I, I appreciate it. Appreciate yeah, it. I do what I can. No, you're welcome. Um, so he left for that reason and started doing all this. But here's some other stuff too, right? Because you've probably heard their names on some other stuff. Uh, before all that, Travis created Fate in 2005 and was project and engineer lead on Mythos. Uh, before it turns out, he got hands on with a flagship studio in 2008. Um, and then Eric was co creator and lead designer of Diablo. Nice. And Diablo 2, and went on to lead Hellgate London. So when he left, that's why Diablo felt, that's why Diablo 3 felt different. I mean, than Diablo 2. We could say it was that, I'm but is it that. really? Probably. We can go with it. We'll just blame it all on three, Eric. Okay, so Diablo 3 wasn't bad. I enjoyed Diablo 3. Um, it just felt different. I, I mean, obviously, it was 10 years later, so it should have felt different, but mm. I don't know. It just didn't have that same, like, man, Diablo 2 was so special. It was just gritty and dark, mm-hmm. and I don't know. I felt I felt like I was in hell, and Diablo 3... Like you as a character or you as a player? A little bit of both. That's scary. Nobody yeah. should ever have to feel like that. Yeah. And then Diablo 3, while the environments were great, they were gruesome and dark, it was just very lit up, you know, so it, it had a different feel to it. So I'm going to say he was, the, he was dark. Maybe he's really dark. Maybe that's it. He's just like, he sits at home and just like writes poetry that's like super, I don't, super It doesn't intense. say on here he's a poet. I mean, it, it could <laughs> be wrong, but I, mean, I don't, I don't want to get that deep in it. But um, yeah, so Double Damage Games, man. That's such a cool way to come out, right? Like you had like some big titles and you're just like, you know what? I started this company, I'm going to leave and step away, make another company, and I'm going to make this game. So how crazy is that, right? Because most places nowadays, it's like you have to report to a publisher or developer, and then you fall within whatever guidelines they set for you. But in the indie world, you can do something, turn it out, and then hop on out, and then do something else too, which is actually pretty cool. Yeah, I like that, because a lot of of like... um Indie developers are actually from that. They're from other studios yeah. where they had worked on these games for such a long time. They had kind of they'd honed their skills really well uh, mm-hmm. under these other studios, and then once they break away from that, they actually go and create the vision they want. Like that's exactly what happened at Yacht Club. So they were actually all people from uh, Way Forward Technologies who did like a bunch of just like really wonky games. Um, here, let me pull it up real quick. What they did, but they were all games like uh, I want to say. Full auto, but that's not correct. Um, okay, so yeah, they just did like crappy games like X Men, the official game. <laughs> they did crappy games. Well, they I mean, okay, like, okay, they did like Godzilla. They did X Men, the official game, SpongeBob SquarePants, so a lot Lamp, of, Camera a lot of the Pants. Movie games. Yeah, exactly. So just, you know, really basic stuff. They did Shrek, Looney Tunes. So they were basically that studio who was basically given, hey, this game's going to come out or this movie's going to come out in a year. You need to crank your game out and it needs to release the same day as the movie does that makes sense so i mean that's what they were from so they put out a lot of games that were just kind of they probably didn't have much love for Mm -hmm. they were just hey go code this go do this make this art and then eventually i guess they got tired of it and they were like hey we're gonna go create our own thing we're gonna go create yacht club games and put out a fucking gem a goddamn fucking gem like shovel knight if you would if you would have went these people made the SpongeBob SquarePants game, and then a few years down the road, they put out Shovel Knight, I'd have told you that you're a goddamn moron. (laughs) Goddamn moron. Goddamn Goddamn moron. There is no way the people who made that game can turn around and do something this beautiful. But it just shows that sometimes being part of these bigger companies, having these publishers, everything like that, can really stifle their creativity that these people have. It's not, I wouldn't even say like stifling, like stifling would make it seem like they just don't, uh, they don't allow it. Right. Some studios have actually like looked outside and like branched outside of it and they've been okay with it. So it's like Ubisoft, we've gotten a child of light out of it. Right. 
And then we've gotten a few others as well, like Activision did Singularity, which was uh, different than their normal stuff. The big one that just came out, uh, I Am Setsuna, was actually published by uh, Square. Square. Right. Correct, yeah. And that, from my understanding, is like the successor, how people are viewing it to like Chrono Trigger and like Final Fantasy Tactics. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, that's, that's a good way to spin it. Um, but they're still not indie games, right? They're Correct. still made by like the triple A publishers that have all the money and can throw the expense out of it. Yeah. But it's they do have creativity there. It's in the studio. It's just how much money, how much resource can they allot, how much yeah. time. So for them on that bigger scale, it's a little harder to move around, like the creativity and have that kind of like ability to do that stuff. But with these people, right, you have small teams like uh, Heart Machines, I think is made of like maybe, oh, you know what? I actually have it pulled up right here. God, it's not, it's like, Ten, seven maybe seven Look, to ten i don't know if you can see this but if you can we're gonna go through who everybody is right that's not very many two three so we're up to five four so nine boom done. nine people i was gonna say it's an incredibly small team Nine people i'm sure there might have been like second or third party or like maybe interns i really don't know um but very small team right yep no man's sky 20 15 people started at 15 i think it ended at like 22 or something 21 something 22 like yeah really small team made a big ass game yeah. um so a lot of these people too even another one that we just have um because we were kind of talking about it off thing was uh fury yeah on uh which was free last month on playstation plus god the game is so good um but it's made by uh the game bakers and it's actually made by two ex-members of ubisoft and those people are emmerich toa and then uh audrey leprintz and that's probably one of the coolest different ideas that I've seen in a while from Fury because the art style too is really dynamic. Uh, but essentially you're like locked away in some prison that's like actually off of Earth. Yeah. And you're actually trying to battle through all these boss fights to get back. Oh, I lied to you earlier. I did download. I haven't played Fury, but I downloaded it. Okay, cool. Yeah, because you, you, you were asking me if I downloaded it. I was like, no, you're full. No, like, I, I definitely missed it. That's really good. But um, no, I, I definitely downloaded I, I pulled up a picture of it right now. I was like, oh, yeah. I played and the art style is kind of cool too because it reminds me of like Samurai Champloo with like Afro Samurai. So like no complaints like whatsoever. And before that, like you were just saying, like they made games that like people weren't really aware of. So like 2011, they made Squids, iOS and Android, right? And PC and Mac release. Squids Wild West next. Combo Crew. Squids Odyssey. So the Squids title for a while. And then out of nowhere, you get Fury on console release. And then Xbox as well. This game is or Microsoft a Microsoft Windows. This game is a 3D version of Hyperlight Drifter. It would almost seem to be that, wouldn't it? I'm like looking at. It, he's got like the light up sword. He's all like that's what this game is. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. No, because nothing if it's a good all. thing, might as well copy yeah. it, right? Exactly. There but no, I, I'm like looking through like all screenshots, and I'm even like I watched a video. I was like. I've played this before in 2D right. in a flatter screen. Um, so we could talk all day, I think, about like the stuff that we're playing and like who we need to give thanks to that made this kind of stuff. And obviously, like if we can, I'm going to start reaching out to like everybody here and see how we can try to schedule and get some get them to actually talk to you guys. And we'll bring that to the live show next time too. Maybe what we'll do is we'll just tweet at them like uncontrollably. We'll tweet a lot until they just are like, "Fuck you guys! We're going to come on your show to shut you up." That's all I need. Hopefully. Uh, hashtag for this whole thing, which I did not put in this corner because I didn't make it in time, was uh, uh, independent. Hashtag independent. It is spelt I-N-D-I-E dash. No dash. No, I'm you, putting it. You, no, I didn't put a dash. I was like, dash breaks up a hashtag. Don't lie to me. I'm just, um, I'm just being. P-E-N-D-E-N-T. Independent. Yeah, I spelled it right. Okay. Boom. That's what we're going to hashtag on everything with this. Do now. it. Done. Because we're the independent podcast from Fat Island Gaming, and we talk about indie games all the time. All that's all we do. Half the time we come in here, we don't remember the last AAA thing we bought. Honestly, so I was talking about that. I talked about that last podcast. I I was trying to like grind through. I was like, "What is the last? Yeah, it was the last thing I actually picked AAA up? Triple A game yep. that I purchased, and I could not for the life of me. I was like, maybe Battleborn forever ago. I think so. But I'm like, there there has to be some. No, I, I remembered what it was. It was Just Dance. Yeah, but it's like even then too, like that's still like it's okay. A I double mean, A game? Ah, whatever. Is that what you're gonna call I it? I don't care. What's I think that's where, I think that's where you're going. I get what you that. mean though. It came from like one of the bigger figureheads. Like yeah, exactly. Off, so yeah, but it's not like one of those games that's, that's like that like blows you away. What Fat Island stream during the day? What? Yep, Fat Island present independent podcast where we talk about indie games for the most part. Then pretty much whatever else is on our mind. Like I said, this show has no structure so far. We're kind of just beating around the bush and yep. moving into the next thing. Yep. Um. So I know we had a, a talk offset offset that we were thinking about. Are we going to offset it? Doing. Yeah, we're going to offset it right now. So we want to give people an idea 
of games to look out for, games that we've heard of, and a little bit of the news. So if you don't mind, oh, I got a little bit of indie news coming up. Oh, I don't. Good. Because care. this shit's going to fly off the handle, son. No, you go for it. Fly off the handle. Okay, it's so cool. This I'm, one I got on my phone. I'm going to pull that up real quick. like, Dude, I'm like... And, and by real quick, like, I mean, it, it's probably going to be a bit... Like, I'm so... I, this whole time you've been talking, I'm literally just going through watching videos and pictures of Fury. It looks so good. It is. It's it really looks good. so fucking and, uh, good, man. You, you oh need my to God. not look at the reviews for Fury because no, like half the people are just complaining that it is too difficult. Honestly, man, when's the last time you've been challenged by a game? Like genuinely challenged by the mechanics itself. It's been a bit. To the point where you're like furious. Dark Souls, the game is invented that way, right? Yeah. So it's Bloodborne. And it's it's... Those games are more just learning. Yeah, right? It's just like learning how people attack, when to roll. Even in this game, it's the same thing, right? Like bosses all have like different and it's so cool. It brings back an old mechanic that I miss so much is after you get a boss fight down to a certain amount of health, they change. They like shift up on you, right? Yeah. So they've got different life bars. You have life bars too, and you kind of go through a little bit of a change as well, but nothing crazy. So tell me this is not a picture like straight out of Hyperlight Drifter. I won't tell you it isn't because it probably is. No, I mean it's not. It's, I know. It's, I it's know. a picture from Fury. I know. So I'll try and I'll try and post it later for everybody out there because right. this is like a straight picture. So a little bit of game. indie news here, um, because some of these things you'll be hearing us plug like for uh, Indiegogo, Kickstarter is another big one for uh, indie games. We'll talk about some stuff yeah. from PAX when that comes up and it's relevant, uh, or somebody from PAX reaches out to us. I'm just saying, we mean business here. I'm just kidding. Hey, you know what we haven't talked to in a while? Who's that? The CEO of IndieBox. Yeah, so I actually was talking to him a little bit ago. Um, so how's anybody who doesn't know, doing? IndieBox creates these beautiful collector's editions for indie games. And we're going to say it again, not sponsored. Not sponsored. Not sponsored. Not we sponsored. love the guy, though. They're, they're fantastic. Guy. Anybody who supports indie indie games like like this company does, I, I have to at least give some love to, especially on an indie Absolutely. pendant podcast. We have to. Let's give him a shout. Let's give him a plug. James Morgan, you rock. Boom. Do you know his Twitter handle? Is it just the indie box one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is so just at, just tweet at, at, indie, at, at indie box. box. There at go. the indie box, I think. Pretty sure. Double check it. Pretty sure. <laughs> but either way, so they put out these beautiful collector's editions of indie games, which all these are. And then they come with some fantastic actual. So this is right here. I'm going to. Yep. Go for it. We've been talking oh, about God. that all day. So these are these are the the games themselves. So they actually come with two copies. They come with a Steam key of the game, and then they come with these beautiful little things. So this, if I open this up, boom, blew your mind just now. Flash drive with the game, and on that it. one's got some weight on it. This one's pretty fucking big. Like holy <laughs> shit! It's like, I mean, that's my hand. I'm six two. I got big old hands, and this is huge. Oh, you you can put it whatever knocked, you want. Because I knocked another one over. No What's this gaming news? I'm all like. This indie news. You got me all excited. You all got right. me all pumped So, for it. I don't know if anybody remembers the debacle with Blizzard. We're going to break away from indie for two seconds, but it does swing back around. I promise. Just follow Goes down my rabbit circle. hole for a minute. Um, so, right. Indie, right? So, when we're taking a look at this kind of stuff, um, Blizzard had this thing a while ago where there was a WoW server that went up. And the WoW server was independent. Um, but it did take subscription costs, but it kept WoW in the original vanilla state. Yep. So, before all the changes and everything else happened, it had a big player base. And when Blizzard found out what was going on, they pulled the plug. And they did it not because they hated what those people were doing. They hated it because it was collecting money off their product, right? Which is fair. So this is where it can take a turn. Sometimes you can make something good and still be rewarded for it, even if you're independent. So what this is, is um, if anybody knows, there's a StarCraft MMO that plays very similar to WoW, and it's just a mod for StarCraft. So if you have StarCraft, you can get this mod and it'll become an MMO StarCraft game. Sounds fucking perfect. It sounds fucking sounds beautiful. So good. Blizzard, why haven't you done that? Right? And they have no intention to because they let this guy scot free. No, because on it. they don't want to directly compete with themselves. Directly compete with themselves. That'd be Boom. retarded. 100%. I read your mind. Yeah. I'm on the same wavelength. Beard length at this point. No, mine's longer now. Yours is longer. Mine's like yeah. ferocious. Like, yeah, I actually need to get the really name good. of your barber and trim up these split ends. It's getting kind of wicked. They're really good. Um, so I'll just pick up right where this is. But anyways, there's a gentleman here um, that made a very popular game uh, for the StarCraft MMO. And what it is is he did this originally on like a uh, Kickstarter, and the guy's name is Winzen, right? Okay. So what happened was is when Blizzard caught wind of this and saw what was going on, this guy also made like the opening cutscene and everything that's actually on my phone. Beautiful. 
looks just like Blizzard animated because you know how crazy they get with their cutscenes. Yeah, just as good, Absurd. if not better, if not magic, if not better, if not better. I'll say it. I'll go out there. It's wild. We'll have to watch it later. I'll even. I'm gonna, I'll throw it up on the edited version. I'm going to call too. you on that because they do some like beautiful. Trust me. Trust me when I tell you it's really good. So what happened was is um, once they caught wind of it and they found out what was going on, they asked him to take it down. Yep. After they found out it was not to compete or take money from them, this was always going to be a mod to StarCraft. It was not going to do independent servers. It wasn't going to do like a subscription. Any, a subscription. It wasn't going to be required to cost to pay, anything like that. So it got a Kickstarter and it got pretty well. Um, it was successfully funded in 2013 and reached $84,000. Nice. That's a pretty good amount. That'll keep you yeah. going for a bit. Pretty sweet. Um, but now there's an Indiegogo campaign to raise money for the maintenance um, since Wyndon can't actually sell the game properly because he can't do anything like that. So, I mean, that makes sense. Like, So people need to forget that just because somebody put a game out there, it's still their intellectual property. It's mm-hmm. still their piece of art that they've, you know, hundreds of people, depending on the size of the team, but people have spent a lot of time and energy making that game. You're not allowed to just go in there and like rip it apart and then rebuild it the way you want. And then sell and it. And then charge for it. No. That's, I mean. But if people rightfully give you the money to maintain something like that, and it is a mod, and no matter what, you still need the first piece of it all. Correct. Which is StarCraft II. Yep. Um, they do offer a, what is it? I read it, and I, like, I almost did it for myself. It's a free, oh my god. Free like starter edition of yeah. StarCraft 2, right? So even if you have that, this mod works for it. That's cool. So that is pretty neat. So the Indiegogo campaign, um, I might throw a link later down on YouTube once we get that up there so people can go support Winston and tell them what's up. You guys can give the uh, mod a try. But my God. Yeah. I'm probably going to put like the video down on the bottom over here playing. Spectacular. Will blow your damn mind. Nice. Guy did a really good job. So is that one? Is that is that what you're excited for? Uh, that was one of the big pieces of any news. Uh, Blizzard even gave it its blessing and wished them all the best for it. Um, because I'm assuming if that thing gets big enough, they might rake them in. We just saw we just saw the opposite side of that with um, Galaxy and Turmoil. Fill me in. So Galaxy and Turmoil was the Battlefront three. Um. Basically, oh, you're right. You're right. Fa- right. Fan made, fan made. That was going on, and, and they had to change the name, right? Yeah, it's actually not going. No, so they're going to keep it. Galaxy and Turmoil is actually mm. exactly what it's going to be called, okay. but it's not going to have any um, Star Wars stuff. Star Wars, yeah, it's not going to have any Star Wars skins, IP. It's, so it's just going to be the mechanics we love. Exactly, but there they're going to create their own brand new IP. So that actually came after a cease and desist from Lucas Arts, and the the head of their team went and sat down with LucasArts and they basically talked about it and came to an announcement where um, Frontwire Studios <laughs> president and LucasArts came to an agreement where they were saying, you can still use all the assets you've created. Mm-hmm. You can still use the gameplay. You can still use everything that's going on. Nice. You just can't use the Star Wars skin. They even went on to say, we would have licensed them the IP but they're in a multi-year exclusive contract with EA, allowing them to not give that up. Disgusting. But that's not really anybody's fault. Obviously, from EA's perspective, it was a brilliant idea to get that contract signed by LucasArts. Probably great and lucrative for LucasArts as well, because they probably made a ton of money from EA. Probably. And really, you you can't you can't be mad at anybody. It was just business decisions going out. Mm-hmm. They didn't try and destroy the whole project, with, mm-hmm. which they probably could have. Probably. Um. They probably could have just shut it down, especially with like LucasArts and EA having so much money. Probably. They could have easily just come in and shut the whole project, taken, seized all the assets, and been like, you guys are done. They didn't. They said, go ahead, keep what you guys have made, make your own game, new IP, no Star Wars stuff on it, and it's yours, and we're fine. I think that's cool. I do, too. I like when uh, bigger publishers give them the blessing. Yep. Same time, too. I feel like there, there has to be some rollover for them somewhere sometimes. Yep. So, I don't know. I really like that, though. Yeah, that's legit. I'm really excited to play it too because they said it's going to have everything they wanted: the uh, single player campaign, 64 player online campaigns, destructible cam, uh, destructible ships. It's going to even have their their goal is to do a uh, ground to space combat. Everything Battlefront should have been. So, <clears throat> I love the idea of ground to space combat. I don't think it's going to work. No Man's Sky did it. Okay, but it's doing it with one person. The problem is... Dude, a lot of people logged on, actually. The problem is, though, is if you have 64 people in one match, right? Mm-hmm. Let's, let's say half are split to the ground, half are split to space. So okay. now you have 32 in space, 32 on the ground. What's just to keep everybody on the ground going up to space? The number of ships available. Okay, but then what if you want to go to space and you can't get to a ship? 
but you you like spec your character as like an engineer, like a pilot to go to space. I'm but assuming when you die, is, it probably has the respawn mechanic where you select another class. I don't know. See, that to me just seems it seems iffy. Like it sounds it seems great, exactly like Battlefront. It sounds fantastic that they did for years. What's up? What? No, Battlefront never did that. You would be able to pick your stuff and equipment loadouts. Yeah, and then but your you, hero but stuff. you either went to ground combat or space combat. There wasn't. There was never a mode. I get what you both. mean. The transitioning phase yeah. is scary to people. If you have, especially if you have, this. let's say you have ten people flying up into space. So then there's those ten people who are just not in but any they, battle. But they at can't. All. But they can't fly into space. Why not? Because I'm going to have a light net uh, that's going to catch them. Get out of so here! So as they lift, I just catch and reel them in. No, and I, I and I screw them over royally. I hope, I hope with everything I have that it comes out and it launches and it works. I'm just very worried that the mechanic won't work from going to ground to space or space to ground, however you want to look. It's at like it. spicy saying, spicy saying. It sounds like you have two mild experiences instead of one great experience. It's true. I guess I could see that because you could whitewash both those experiences and put them in one, and then it's like we were able to do it. But it's not as thick or intuitive as we were hoping. Yeah. I get what you mean. Because I mean, especially like now that we're getting used to having like the larger, the larger like, games and worlds. Yeah, exactly. So like when you else. go and play battle, uh, like Battlefield, mm -hmm. and you have like these huge armies, even the people who are in this, like you know, airplanes and stuff like that, they're still affecting the ground combat. Right. When the people who are in space are gonna ha probably have not much to do with the ground combat. Now, if they do some way where it's like, let's say from episode two where they have like the shields over them and you have to go in space to like destroy the command ship to turn all the droids off. Like, okay. Something like that would be really cool if they right. like interact together. Mm -hmm. If they're two separate battlefields and they just exist on the same map, that just it it's just there to appease people. I get what you're saying. It's not I there do. to make a good game. That's what that's how I feel anyways. So like the first battlefront that EA did? Oh, moving on. Okay. Yeah. So anyways, um, what I'm else sorry, are you looking forward to? Wearing your Star Wars shirt. I'm just going to mess you up. So this will be the last bit of news because I thought that Jason, I'm probably going to mess this up, Jason. I'm sorry. Jason Schreier. Uh, he's a writer over at Kotaku and I will credit people if I read their articles. Absolutely. Um, but he wrote this really nice article that I was digging. It was like last week of July. He posted it. It says lot, lots of Destiny devs have left Bungie recently to make indie games. You read this article? Yep. Fucking awesome, right? There's so many people are leaving uh, Bungie. A lot of well, not even Bungie. Like a lot of people have left AAA it's publishers yeah. to strike like their own gold. It's not so much gold, right? It's just like they've worked for the man enough. They and now they they have an idea and concept. They can essentially kind of like run their own business. I'm sure it is difficult. Nobody's saying this is oh, easy. Yeah. But like, there's a lot of people that are out there in creative that have an idea, and if it never comes to fruition, they don't have a mark on the world, right? Yep. You're just that guy rolling through the credits that also worked on this really big game. Yep. You can be proud of that. Don't get me wrong. You can even stay with that your whole life. It's fine. Just some people yearn for more satisfaction, getting their game out there. Maybe it sells well, maybe it doesn't, but at least they tried. At least they could put it out there and say, this is my vision. Exactly. This is what I wanted this game to be. Yep. And then uh, some of them are really successful. Like Outlast is working on Outlast 2. The, God, I can't think of the team who made that. Outlast is working on Outlast 2. The, the team who That's made, a good point. The team who made Outlast is I, now I working on... I get you. On, yeah. I get you. I was like, I can't think of the name Whistleblower of Whistleblower the... Studios? No, no, no. That was their... Oh, my God. Whistleblower is their DLC. Uh, like I said, this is uh, this is uncut. This is no homework. Red, red Barrels. Red Barrels. There you go. That's who did it. Um, I was going to say, no, it's not... Definitely not that. So in this article, he goes on to explain that the shift is not necessarily uncommon anymore in the video game industry, and the grind on AAA titles can sometimes be a lot. It's literally a grind, and when it comes to crunch time, I'm sure it's rough. Um, but a lot of people have left the company, and then he goes on to like list like a lot of these people that are doing really cool games. Um, one of the biggest ones that we saw that was showcased on, I don't know if it was this year's E3 or last one for PlayStation. Which one? It's a VR game. It's called Golem. It's last where year. it was last year, right? It was last year. So, uh, and it looks great. So it's a uh, ex, uh, <clears throat> it's a uh, director, Jamie Grayson and composer, Marty O'Donnell by that big lawsuit settlement with Bungie. Uh, we're both employees at Bungie for a long time. O'Donnell was fired from the company in 2014 and later won a successful, uh, lawsuit over unpaid benefits. Uh, they're not, now they're working together on a promising indie looking VR game called Golem, um, at the studio Highwire games, which also employs several other former uh, Bungie people, including uh, artist Vic Vic De, Le De Leon. De Leon. De Leon. De Leon. Nice. De Leon. I could say that for hours. Um, That's one thing that game had down pat was the fucking like graphics. 
Yeah, and just it was the look to the game. The it was look really and the good. Feel yeah, were perfect. And uh, a total goal, golem too, right? So like an inanimate thing that like comes to life, yep. and like the VR controlling to it. I like too that they didn't shy away from the blue hue on the character's eyes. I was like, man, this is cool. Um, I'll probably throw a screenshot of that up here. Um, next one that was done too is called Time Spinner. Um, this one's like a uh, 2D side scroller. It was a successful Kickstarter of uh, Metroidvania that's still in development. Nice. It's led by Boydie Lee, who left Bungie in 2014. Uh, and What's got that some one incredible called? Animations. Uh, Time Spinner is that one. I don't know if that's made by one person entirely or what, but that's pretty sick. Um, next one, right? Keep again, too. These are just Bungie devs that left and started indie titles. Another one here is Assemblance. Uh, this fantastic mindfuck was released last month to mixed reviews. Niall Sankey, who directed the game, last Bungie in early 2015. Um, and then you've also got uh, Game Moria, uh, described as cross between Secret of Mana and Pokemon. Oh, God, Game Moria is still in development and takes in around $600 a month on Patreon. Uh, director Isaiah Sherman was the artist uh, on Destiny and left Bungie in 2014. Okay, this Time Spinners game looks fucking great. Doesn't it? It's like, God, I don't even... Metroidvania. Yeah. That's perfect description. That really is. Like, it's just way. so good. Holy <laughs> shit. Like, Castlevania meets Mega Man. I'm okay with that. No, who isn't? I'm... Especially if it's done right. Castle Man? Castle Man. Is that the Mega... genre title? Megavania? Mega... No. Megavania? I don't like it. Don't like it. No? A Castle Man sounds cooler. Castle Man does sound pretty Castle cool. Castle Man sounds really awesome. We've just named your guys as genre. We just named a genre. Castle if it's Man. Mega Man and Castlevania esque, you are now Castle Man genre. Yeah. I like that because it's also a character, I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. He just stonewalls you everywhere. <laughs> Castle Man. You want to oh. start a Kickstarter? Oh. oh, shit. Dude, there's like a, like a half cat robot in this game. Oh, oh yeah. shit. I saw the same GIF right now. Yeah. No, I'm watching. I'm watching the trailer. I'm watching the Kickstarter trailer. Because it <laughs> I'm looks gonna, great. I'm gonna keep it going while he's lost in. <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, Stardust. Over yeah, there. please do it. Uh, next one. House of the Dying Sun. Uh, former Bungie employee Mike Tiplett led development on the space shooter, which Kirk digs quite a bit. Uh, it channels PC classics like Tie Fighter and Freelancer. Do you remember Freelancer in space? Nope. That game was I played shit. a lot of Tie Fighter. There you go. I played so much of that. Holy <laughs> shit. Next one, and this is kind of funny. Uh, Gary the Gull. Gary the Gull. He's a seagull. Uh, this yeah. Pixar-ish interactive movie was headed up by Tom Sinachi. Uh, I'm probably going to say this one wrong, actually. Sinochi. Sinaki. We'll go with either one. A technical art lead on De on Destiny who left Bungie in 2015. Uh, he and his team showed Gary the Gull at GDC earlier this year. Nice. Another one, Jump. This, this goes on for a bit, guys. There's a lot of indie titles coming out from these guys. Uh, veteran game artist Tom Doyle, who left Bungie in 2015, founded a company called Endeavor, one with some of the former employees. Their first VR game, Jump, came out on Steam last year. I think that's something, too, is a lot of people are getting tired of maybe just cranking out the same project. So, obviously, they worked on Destiny. Now, it's just kind of like a DLC grind until, you know, Destiny 2. Well, and here's the thing hits. with that, too, right? So, like, during the PS3 into the PS4 era. Yeah. Because I really don't think indies became, like, a popular word <clears throat> by masses, right? 100%. Until probably PS4 and Xbox like, One. Uh, with, besides, besides PC Master Race people that have been accessible to it on Steam for the longest time. I'd say end of uh, end of end of last console because you did get some games like that Super Meat Boy yeah. and stuff like that that were really big on the and older Fez consoles. Yeah, exactly. Was another big one yeah. that even got like their own movie, yep. which was really cool. Um, with that kind of stuff, right? So it's um, it's always been accessible. It's always been there, but now that people see that people actually want these different experiences, they don't it's want the same triple A grind the whole time. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Anybody that picks up Call of Duty every year, you do you, boo boo. I mean, there's nothing anybody else can do about it. I can do something about it. You need to not do I that. I can introduce you to awesome independent games. Independent? You should have thrown in independent. It was too creative. Uh, I'm not I'm not in a creative mood. I this is only like my sixth cup of coffee this morning. I was saying this is like my fifth, and yeah. I'm just like, I'm still not feeling yeah, it. I'm still like, or maybe we do and we just don't notice. Yeah. Like it's just not translating to us. <clears throat> um so they're just cranking out these games. I'm sure they take a few years for some of these people and other games are just coming out left and right from some of these old AAA uh, people. Yeah. But it's like with the ability to do this, like why not? Like what's there to say? People usually get a Kickstarter. They usually don't have to drop a dime on themselves. I mean, that's how uh, they go unpaid for a bit. That's how Hyperlight Drifter made it. It was a Kickstarter. It raised a ton of money on Kickstarter too. Like it, did, it was it like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. Like 
Oh, let me pull it up. Let's see the if I can um, other one that was really successful too, doing the same thing, was Axiom Verge. Yeah. Oh God. By Thomas Happ. That game is so. Good. Thomas, you're a brilliant man. Fucking good. You are. Brilliant, I totally man. forgot about that. So good. Because I beat it and it was so good. I love everything about it. Fuck. I want to be the main character. I want a jacket that lets me do that. <laughs> Which one? The first one. The, everything about it. The first it. jacket or the second jacket? Because don't you get like a second overcoat? Hold on. Lethal Migraine, I'm reading your thing. Hold on. Okay, here we go. I pulled it up. So Hyperlight Drifter had 24,000 backers and pledged $645,000 for this game. Really good. I'd say that's really fair. Really fucking good. <laughs> I think this game easily deserves that. I hope he made at least that much as well. I hope he made double that. Off it the sold. The game. I know on PC release it was like one hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah, easy. Is that of, copies? Of, no, copies. Okay, a twenty dollars a piece. I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. You know, it might even be money. on like a Steam sale really quick after that. I don't yeah. know, but I know it's a lot. It breaks down to a lot, no matter which way you look. And at then it. when it dropped on uh, PS4, I know a lot of people picked it up. Yeah, I bought it first and day, and I did too. Yeah. And then I know some people like Peter <clears throat> are actually waiting for it to come to the Vita. And honestly, when it comes to the Vita, I'm going to rebuy it. I thought it was a crossover, no? Nope. That's great. It's got cross save, but not cross buy. Oh, let me read this. So, Lethal Migrade. To be fair, instead of making a wise business decision and, ma- and releasing AAA games like right now, devs just released them all in the fall. Indies thrive because March and August there is... Uh, Nothing big not- to play. Nothing. And I agree with that entirely. Don't get me wrong. But that wasn't a trend until... Well, a few years back. It's just it's getting worse and worse every year as far as like everybody just holding off to the fall to launch their games because my wallet's gonna hurt this quarter, I'm not gonna lie. Because every year, so obviously fall is when things sell. Because you have Christmas, you have the Sales. holidays. People actually go to the stores to buy these things. Correct. They're actually out off Correct. their butts trying to do Christmas shopping. So, so everybody you- wants to release right around then. Mm-hmm. But then the problem is is you just get bogged down with like a hundred things. I mean, last year we had mm-hmm. in a three week period we had Star Wars Battlefront launch, Fallout, yeah, yep. Tomb Raider, yep. Call of Duty. Yes. In a three-week period, all four of those games launched. Why? Destiny expansion, Taken King as well. Yeah. Was in there, too. There we in go, September. yeah. That was just absolutely absurd. And it's, <laughs> it's happening this year again, too. P- pretty much after, I think, Battlefield. The problem with this year is, if nobody knows me, there's a problem. You need to follow me on Twitter. I have an addiction for, like, you collector's do. editions, right? How many are you getting this year? Don't. Like eight? Fucking ask. <laughs> I think it's like eight of them. It's like ten. <laughs> so bad. Are you getting the Pokemon? <coughs> Steelbook? I got those. Yeah. I don't have a DS, but I got them. So beautiful. I got it. Got How it could you lock. not? First Pokemon Steelbook to make it to North America? Have to have it. I have to have it. Absolutely. Um, first licensed one, too, right? For good stuff. Yeah. Um, but with that, too, right? So it's like the indie stuff and everything else now, that's good. And there's good indie games that come out that actually yep. deserve the money. Before, for the longest time, it was just kind of like some sheltered stuff. It wasn't all that crazy. I mean, it was like little things here and there. But now people are getting intuitive and they're making little teams and they're making big shit happen. And it's an exciting time to play indie games. Like, absolutely. As long as PAX has been around, like, indie games have always been fun to play. I'm not saying they haven't. But, like, there are just certain ones now that pull on your heartstrings. Just a lot of them are more affordable now. Some of the ones that are, like, five bucks that are I'm actually having, like, a shitload of fun with compared to, like, AAA titles now. What people don't realize either is the consoles <coughs> um, are becoming easier to develop for as well. And Lethal Migraine. I agree with you, too, on, like, how you're setting that up. So, like, yeah, it's, it's a lot of money they're going. Kids are out on the summer... You know, another yep. summer releases too are pretty crazy for indie games. That's why a lot of people try to get out right now. Yep. So, I forgot what I was saying. Uh, it's not important battle anymore. Rattle battle not- rattle. If console battle truly rattle. wants indie, the stores must lower the cost of updates. Otherwise, the true indie games will stay on PC and update their games frequently. And I agree with that too. And you know what I actually saw recently? Battle rattle was, um, but believe it or not, it was. Um, they're starting to be more okay with sales. Like, have you noticed PlayStation Flash sales are just going out of always. style right now, They're right? Like always running. They it's say, not even a they sale say it's like for summer, but man, it is just ripping every weekend and every week. Like, I almost did, um, they almost got me. I don't have the season pass yet for uh, Batman Arkham Knight. I yeah, love no. that fucking game, and I really want the DLC. It was only 10 bucks out of like 30 I think or twenty. I think the consoles are definitely getting better as far as seeing indie games. I think this new generation allowed it because, like, I was that. That's what I was saying. That's what I forgot. Is um, you forget a lot. These new consoles are becoming easier for them to develop for. They're more friendly. Yeah, and they have a lot of power to too. Exactly. So, like, you don't have to worry about like a two D pixel game stuttering or having issues. You just have to optimize stressing out your console. Yep. Yeah. 
So, that, I mean, that's allowing more and more of them to come to console. The nice thing about PC is it is easier to develop for a PC game than it is. Mm-hmm. It's also easier to just let people go in and just update them whenever they yep. need. And uh, <clears throat> lethal or spicy, I couldn't see because it's kind of it's going a little bit faster than I can keep up with over here. <clears throat> but you're right. October this year is stupid packed. Stupid. Let me tell you what's on my list alone. Go for it. October 13th, PlayStation VR headset. Yeah. That's happening. Woo! Um, because... Two weeks before that, Final Fantasy 15, and you can use it. And yes, then they announced so the cin- they, have, they announced the cinema mode, so I don't even need a monitor anymore or a TV. I can just put on my headset and the controller in my hand, and never ever log out into the real world. Just sort out on. I want to do Destiny with it and see if it helps at all with like the modular, or it might just. I don't know. I don't know. I'm crazy. All right, let's see. Yeah. Next, right after that, next week, Battlefield. Getting the collectors. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right after that. Oh, like a week and a half later. The Last Guardian, October 25th, Collector's Edition. Duh. October 28th, Skyrim Remastered. No collectors, otherwise yeah. I would. Titanfall 2, the same day. Collectors. Collector's Edition. <laughs> Dragon Ball Xenoverse 2. Collectors if it gets same announced. Same day. Oh, it's collectors. I have it. What what comes with the collectors? Super Saiyan 1 Goku. Uh, like from uh, Namek, where he's, like, he's all like beating the shit. Oh, okay. Because the first one, they had... Uh, Capsule Corp's trunk. Yeah. And that was kind of cool, but this is Super Saiyan Goku. If it so was you, Vegeta. You put Goku done. on anything, it moves up like $500. I don't yeah, care. Definitely. Um, so that's my October alone. So that's a lot of money I don't want to look Too at. Too much. That's, that's a lot. Yeah. Wait, when's Pokemon? November, right? November. September. Oh, look it up. Was, look it up. God, I don't fucking know. Uh, There's so much coming out right now. And I, I only purchased it in November before it finally dies down. Dishonored 2 Collector's Edition. But October, yeah. yeah um, needless to say, I'm going to hurt. I'm not looking yeah. forward to it. I am. November but I'm 18th not. for Pokemon. October's really going to hurt. Like I think everybody in the yeah. In the and, world. It's, and then we're going into and then you just go right into November and then not too much comes out in December though because you have a lot to, of people. You know what I think does? Don't quote me, but Kingdom Hearts 2.8 or whatever. Okay, that makes sense though. No, no big, no real big <laughs> AAA titles come out in December, and it's because I think your game has to come out before the first week of December to be in the running for uh, any of the game awards, the video game awards. Uh, that makes sense. So, so people that really don't even need to be in the awards, they then just they don't drop care. It. Yeah. yeah. So like a game, like a game like Kingdom Hearts 2.8, it's just a. It's already won a lot. It's a conglomeration. Just, just give somebody else the space. On exactly. The stage. So they can dump that out whenever they want. Yeah, that makes and sense. So it's honestly smarter to put that out when it's not up against other things right, right, right. than it is. So that's why those big AAA titles all shove themselves in there because they have to push themselves in between Black Friday and like the first week of December. Because if not, you don't get into the Game Awards. So you can't win like you know Game of the Year, Best Independent Game. You can't win any of that stuff. So that's why it all gets cranked out then. That makes sense. That makes a lot more sense than a. Yeah. Uh, what I thought you were going to say. No, no, yeah, it all it all ties together. So yeah, it's the same. And one last thing too, because I don't want to be a dick. I want to finish this article. I got one game, one more game from the Bungie dev for an indie game. Is Inversus, former Destiny sandbox engineer Ryan Juckett designed Inversus, an action strategy game that'll be out on PS4 and PC next month. Uh, Juckett left Bungie earlier this year. Uh, so yeah, just goes right back to it. Inversus. I mean, overall, <laughs> excellent title, right? Uh, so good. Bungie as a whole, apparently you guys can crack out a lot of shit if y'all just quit and make indie <laughs> games. You guys stop making Apparently Destiny. it takes like three people to do it and you've got, yeah. man, whatever you guys hire at Bungie then, holy shit. Yeah, right? I, wonder, I wonder what their team is. I wonder if you go to like one person, he's like, oh, I work on eight monitors. I'm just like, I don't know if anybody's seen Silicon Valley, but there's an episode where like, they're like, you mean I can order anything to help me work more successfully? Yeah. Oh, I need like eight monitors. And then like the guy next to him orders like higher resolution, more mo- and like he's doing all the work on the monitor in front of him and the other ones have like useless window stuff yes. open. So and he's so- basically me when yeah. I use my multi He's a minimalist, but he still needs to show off to yeah. other people. It's so good. That's super awesome. <clears throat> okay, as far as indie games though. Yeah, it's Spicy Beat Taco. Ubisoft, brilliant. Release dates are a little, they're crazy. They're all over, but yeah, I'm don't. okay with it though. Oh crap, that's another one I still get a... I don't know if I'm going to get the collectors this time. What's that? Watch Dogs 2. Really? I, you I were super excited for I'm, it. And I'm even more excited because I finally watched Mr. Robot season one. Yeah. I'm hyped. And then when we hyped for that. And then when we stuff. saw the uh, the little robot at like E3, you lost your shit. I, I really want it. I'm not going to lie, but I'm just like. And I mean, he literally lost his shit. Like he I, had to go change his pants. Like, I just, was <laughs> rushing to the bathroom. It was bad. We ran right by the major founder, CEO of Ubisoft, Evie. God. It was bad. 
Yeah. I'm just kidding. I didn't, it's I, still I didn't so grab my weird. pants in front yeah. of the man. No, of course not. It's, it is really weird he talked to us. Yeah. He was really nice. To this day, I have like, if I have a nightmare, I have a dream about just talking to the man some more. Because it, it just nice. offsets everything. Really, it's everybody so in my life. Everybody, I mean, everyone at E3 is in a good mood because they're there for video games. But like, everyone's super nice. Everybody was genuine it's though. Great. Like, yeah. I never felt like anybody was putting on a face with me. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, usually you could tell they're like, "Oh, this is our game." So and so, everybody else there was like, "This is the game. You need to play it right now." I'm like, "I'm in. Whatever you want, man. Yep. Done deal." Um, <clears throat> I say um a lot. I need to cut that shit out. Uh, uh, that's pretty good. One more time. Uh, Jay Sierra's harmonized right there. It was beautiful. There. And there. I can't I can't sing to save my life or harmonize to save my life. I can drop life. a beat. Don't get me wrong. Maybe next time. Maybe next time. If we hit a certain uh if we hit a certain amount of viewers, maybe we'll we'll do an indie rap next time. Or you can join our Patreon. There we go. Indie rap. <laughs> an indie rap. Ooh, I'd be okay with that. Right. What if we made it like Pokemon rap, but we just drop indie names? Hyperlight Drifter Me Boy. Binding of Isaac. I need more. <laughs> I need more. <laughs> there we go. Just, just start. I don't know. I just like, I don't I'm sorry, you guys. That was terrible. That was pretty bad. It'll be better next time. I promise. Yeah. Well, I, I can't promise that. It might not be better next time. Probably just as bad. See, and I think Tripwire did something else too um, that goes on. So he's asking, Spicy B. Tonga is asking, do you guys consider studios like Overkill, makers of Payday Two, or Tripwire Interactive, uh, makers of Killing Floor Indie Studios? And that all honestly depends on like how the business is ran. So like if we want to talk about it real quick before we get on to the next thing. Yeah, go for it. The way I view an independent developer, <laughs> my ears, sorry, we just we got a little wild there. Um, it's how the business is ran, right? Okay. So if they so, seek their is there Tripwire def- Interactive, I just pulled it up real quick. Cool, so killing go for it. Killing Floor, anyways, uh, was crazy. both published and developed by Tripwire Interactive. So I would say that's yeah, an indie. That's an indie because okay. they're independently funding their own game. Now you could argue because then there's then there's companies like um, Bethesda who develop and publish themselves, mm-hmm. but like they're still not independent. I get you because I mean they they technically are, but they're still like you know big not, monster houses and stuff right. that crank stuff out. So I'm gonna say Tripwire. Yes, I look up Overkill Payday Two. Payday Two. I think that I don't believe so. I think that's Fat actually, Island mixtape coming soon. That's promise right. You, promise you, spicy. I got you, girl. You can talk to that menu at that place all day, and then we'll just drop some fat beats. So, as far as Payday Two, it's actually not because it's actually done by kind of a conglomerate of people. So it's developed by Overkill. Okay. It's designed by Ulf Anderson, who's okay. the designer. Okay. And it's published by Five Hundred Five Games. Five Hundred Five is a bigger publisher. Though. Correct. So it's actually being published by a different company who has nothing to do with the development. Right. So that, at, at its <laughs> core, is not a... That's indie, what we were talking about last year. That's, that's, we look at that as a double-A studio, wouldn't we? Cause Basically, they're not, yeah. They're not triple, because they're not part of or, or self-branded under yeah. them. Uh, but at the same time, too, it, it is coming from an outside source, so that's yeah. what we're looking at with the double-A, right? Yeah, that's like a... Like a third, I mean, it's just a third party game. I get you. You know, it's, it's, I mean, I don't want to take the title of indie away from them if they view it that way. That's not for me to say. Like I said at the beginning of the show, we are not here to say who is indie. The way I view it is, does it have a certain play style that is different than others? And then was it self funded or self made? And then if they seek out a publisher, don't get me wrong, there is nothing wrong with that. Not or everybody, even a, or even if a publisher publish seeks them game. out. Well, it's like, and there's all these other games too that you can do, like a PlayStation Pub. Yep. You know, allows you to get your indie games out there on their consoles, and PlayStation helps you along the way. Microsoft just started theirs. Two K just started theirs. EA just started their. What's indie. Microsoft's called though? I don't remember. Uh, God, it's Microsoft. like the worst. Oh, we talked about it. this is like the worst branding ever. God, yeah, it's stupid. Like, uh, hey, let me pull it up. I don't know. I'll never remember it. It's fine. It's not that great for the name. I remember that distinctly. Yeah, it's like uh, one up. I'm just kidding. It's, it's something know. like that. Yeah. What is it, man? It's called Microsoft something. What is that? Indie. Just Microsoft Indie Publishing. Microsoft Play? I don't know. It's, it's a weird name. Yeah, I don't know. It's if we're weird. having a hard time thinking about it, you should probably rebrand it. Yeah, figure. Yeah, exactly. Because especially when it comes to, like that indie stuff, like I fucking like am all about that. PlayStation Pub like tells me it's laid back. They're here to help. Yeah. Have a beer. Let's figure this out. Like I said, 2K. Don't get me wrong. It's business. But, but it, it weirds me out. So if 2K, EA... Yeah, Sony, EA announcers this year, didn't anything they? Anything like that. Yeah, if anything like that is funding or helping indie develop, are they really indie developers anymore? 
by definition. Well, so let's look at it this way too, right? So like, um, oh shit, I don't know. Well, yeah, no, absolutely. Because like, so Zaboid ID at Xbox. Thank you so much. That is exactly what it's called. That's why ID. I can't remember. I know. It's like a Twitter handle. I I know. I know. Um, <clears throat> see, I'm not a fan of it, obviously. Yeah. Uh, so Zaboid Games, right? Yeah. I love the guys. They're so cool. Um, but they have done other indie games in the past, all through them. Their latest one, which I'm beyond hyped about, is uh, Cosmic Star Heroin. So that game is supposed to come out this summer, finally. And uh, started on Kickstarter, but they were at PlayStation Experience, and I believe they're part of the PlayStation Pub stuff. Nice. Okay. Um, so they do have like a pub, uh, a PlayStation person they can reach out to internally that will like help with like any kind of like hiccups if there's software or firmware issues. I- I'm assuming the person's role probably facilitating codes and stuff as well because obviously like all those <laughs> codes features. that are generated are done through Sony and right. not through. The, the developer and they're probably done with like all the in-house features i'm and, sure like, i'm exactly. sure they have like a build for it whatever yep. um but the whole point there is too is like that's an indie studio the boyd games is an indie studio they are still they run themselves and they pretty much come up with ideas and they pitch it yeah so it's like if they get picked up and published and it's published on their machine it's the same way anybody can upload their own stuff to steam yeah so you're still the, for playstation by you Steam. just have to go to them and ask yeah as long as it clears whatever they're looking for i get that uh spicy peak taco is saying well i'm sure most people consider cuphead an indie game even though it is published by microsoft exactly that is true because i think the studio's idea were that was it bought from them no i think it's I don't think it was bought from them. Was the idea pitched by Microsoft and they found the studio to do it? No, nope. I think it's. I think this. I think it was the other way around. The studio had the idea, and then it was brought to right. Microsoft as far as being uh, supported. Yeah, and Microsoft picked it up. So it's that's still contract where I still view that as indie. They're still independent on it. I'm sure Microsoft might have input on it now, but it's still an indie studio. Technically, it's developed and published by Studio MDHR. So we're gonna go with indie it's, on that one. Yeah, it's not even. I feel like that's wrong because I feel like it is being published by Microsoft, but I guess I'm wrong. I don't know. MDHR. Is it? Did they buy exclusivity off of it? Probably. Maybe. That's probably what happened. That's whatever. We saw how that played yeah. out. Yeah. No, Maker. it's literally MDHR, right? Yeah, MDHR. It's What's MDHR of, stand for? It's consisted of two brothers, Tad and Jared. Okay. Cool. There you go. Oh, it's a uh, it's a breakdown of their last name, Moldenhauer. Cup. Yeah. Okay. Spicy Big Time just reiterated for us. Yeah. They do have full control of their own IP. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Their last name is Moldenhauer. M O L D E N H A U E R M D H R. It's just a breakdown of their last that name. That makes a lot Moldenhauer. of sense. Studio Moldenhauer. Moldenhauer. Yeah, I like it. I do like it. What if we made a studio? Studio. Can we call it Cling to War? I'd be okay with that. All right, there we go. Cling Boom. In, cling to War. Cling to um, War. Except for we don't make games. I will be. Yeah. Well, that's just exactly school, what you're going man. to school for, huh? Uh, we'll see how that goes. We'll do programming real live time on Twitch. Everybody can steal my source codes. I'm kidding. I probably won't. <laughs> you probably will. I will. I'll do it by mistake. Start stream. Sit there and wait. Hopefully okay. It passes. I feel like for the the last bit of this show, what we should talk, talk about, about some things that you should check out on Kickstarter because I found a couple really good ones just now. Okay. So Brandon's gonna lead this part. Okay. So oh, you him. guys. Uh, a lot of great stuff comes from Kickstarter, especially when it comes to indie games. The most recent one that we just hit that we've been talking about all day has been Hyperlight Drifter. Yep. So there's a lot. Uh, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, any of those crowdfundmes are great for these things, and it allows them to Go get off the floor. Do they participate in indie a lot of times, or no? It's no. Usually for something else. It's just, just crowdfunding, I guess, okay, is what I meant. Stuff, uh, Indiegogo, things like that. Watch They're, out, E3 2026. Sorry. So boom. Boom. Um, oh, is that for your game? I, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, right. that's what it's for it's for your game <laughs> they, I don't, hopefully it doesn't take that long but we'll see we'll see but so definitely you guys if you're into the, supporting indie games you know definitely support the developers by first off picking up their games I would also recommend maybe picking up their games at full price all these indie games not waiting for the sales if you don't have the money or you're maybe unsure about a game maybe wait for a sale but if you can pick it up at full price most of them aren't more than $20 you get some crazy ones like I Am Satsuna that come out for 40 but there's plenty of them that you can pick up cheap Buy them at full price, support them. But you can also go onto any of these crowdfunding and support them there. So I pulled up. It's, we're just going to go off Kickstarter because it was a nice list of them there. Okay, go for it. Some games that you should definitely pay attention to. My first one, how could I not pick it just by the name alone? Bear vs. Meth Lab. <laughs> That's right, you guys. Bear vs. Meth Lab. So the game is a four-player game. It's basically just a beat-em-up where... Oh, God. Okay, I didn't even know this, so I, I just pulled it up. I'm reading down here. They're all Canadian. 
Smash Adolf Hitler's interdimensional ma- meth cartel in a frantic four-player party game. Leave no bear behind. So, watching through this trailer, you can pick up your buddies who are bears, chuck them at each other, chuck them at the enemies. You're fighting at an entire meth lab the entire time, made by White Box Interactive. It currently has 24 days left to go, 55 backers, but it is very, very far from its goal. Its goal is 22,000. It's currently at 12,000. Nice. So there's still a lot more time, you guys. The game looks ridiculous. Full customization of your bear. So you can pick your bear, brown bear, polar bear, panda bear. You can give him outfits, hats, mustaches, monocles. Uh, looks like a coat, even. Wow. Okay, cool. Game looks over the top. Reminds me a lot of Castle Crashers, kind of. Uh, just running around, smashing, beating people up, having fun, being stupid. Hmm. Bear vs. Meth Lab. Check it out. Next game. Oh, my God. This game is going to be fantastic. VR game. Where's the fucking light? So <laughs> <laughs> that, that is, so I'm gonna I'm just gonna t- take a shot in the dark. Go for it. You oh. put on your VR headset. Uh-huh. It's black. It's the whole game. It's the entire. That's the entire. Where's the fucking light? Where's the fucking light? <laughs> Funny thing is, its goal is only a hundred dollars. So this whole black thing might be real. It's already pledged three hundred and two dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so hold on. So what I honestly think it's going to be, it's going to be a black room yep. that you use like a controller in your hand. And you literally try to find the light switch in the room. I literally think it'll be that simple. Okay, hold on. I'm pulling up a... I'm watching the trailer for it right now. Okay, so it actually looks like... So it's actually a game. It's a real game. It's not just black. It actually... It looks simple. It doesn't look like there's a ton of motion. It looks like a lot of still images, almost like classic uh, point and click. Mm -hmm. But it actually looks really beautiful. The graphics are really nice. It's really sharp and pretty. Uh, it looks like here. Let me let me pull down so I can get an actual description of the. You game. pull it down, girl. Yep. You pull it down. After a relaxing weekend at a remote hotel in New York City, your last night is nearing, and perhaps it's literal. Ooh, ooh. As your last night is over, you must go home. But everything seems to happen before time. That sentence doesn't make. Oh, this is a translation from Spanish. So this was written in Spanish, so everything might not um, sound perfect. As your last night is over, you must go home, but everything seems to happen before time. After hearing strange noises in the middle of the night, you'll decide to to go and see what's going on. But what a surprise you see when the hotel has no electricity, or at least the lights are not on. What is going on? You only know that it doesn't look good. So I think it's actually going to be more of a horror suspense style point and click adventure. It actually, like, it looks fun on VR. I think I would, I'd love to see some more indie stuff hit VR. I think that'd be really cool. Are you checking it out? Are you watching the trailer? No, I'm pulling something else up. You keep going. Okay, cool. So, I don't know. I think this one looks cool. It's definitely, it is a puzzle game. So, it's just going to be a point and click puzzle game. It looks like a mix between an old Tim Schafer game and PT. That's kind of scary. Anything with PT in it usually makes me uh, just run for the hills most of the time. It looks like it's already been. I, I mean, it's already been completely funded. Like I said, the pledge goal was only a hundred dollars. Currently, twenty backers at three hundred and two dollars. So everyone's putting a little over ten bucks. Hmm. Good stuff. Yeah, I mean, I'm picking up VR. It doesn't say what VR system it's for. It just says VR. I would love. I'm definitely hoping it comes to the PlayStation one because I'll pick it up and I'll stream the shit out of that just for fun. I want to see you do where the, the fucking lights. <laughs> Where's the fucking lights, you guys? <laughs> absolutely fantastic it's so good dude god and there's a couple other ones that look pretty good um god, i'm never gonna be able to say this ambassador of c-i-b-i s-e s-i-e-u-b-i-a c-u-b-i-a sounds um, like we're saying stuff and rewind it actually looks really cool too this one is got currently at twenty five thousand. Or 2,500, not 25,000. 45,000 is the goal. 101 backers, though. 29 days to go. Looks like a just a standard kind of RPG with really, really nice anime graphics. So if you're into anime and you like, um, and you like just sick. classic, you know, kind of adventure <laughs> RPGs, it looks this like one a classic like a JRPG builder. Yeah, or something exactly. Like that. Yeah. So that's definitely another one that I would that I'm pop, you know definitely going to be uh, keeping my eye out for. What about you? What did you pull up? Oh, okay. So what I got pulled up earlier is, so that's stuff to look out for, right? That's Kickstarter things to check the fuck out for. At the end of this, <clears throat> yep. I say we try to do our best of a game that we know is in development that people need to start probably tuning into, right? So like these are the ones that are still out there. Their funding hasn't closed. Correct. Could go either way. Correct. If they want to go help, great. If not, we understand that too. 100%. Yeah. 
but there's some games that have been funded that will blow your fucking mind, right? What do we have? So there's one game that came out to my attention. I've got more, but I was like, you know what? We'll share this bi-weekly. I'm sure it'll be take a bit anyways for, oh my God, this iPad button? Let me tell you. It's so intense. This home button. That case, dude. You could like kill somebody with just the case. It doesn't even be anything yet. in it. Um, I keep talking about this all the time. <clears throat> I'm getting over something. But it's a big deal. This was successfully started on Kickstarter. Yep. It was trying to pledge $500,000 for goal. So already a big goal, right? Yep. Funded $856,354. Nice. <clears throat> and then, so the Kickstarter campaign has closed, but they are still seeking other funding through other means as well. Yeah. Um, they did have a stupid amount of Kickstarter goals, um, which they read to. Like the high tiers. Awesome. I always like when um, they have a lot of tiers. So uh, this is made by Airship Syndicate, is the indie studio. The people nice. on this game are fucking brilliant. The game is called battle chasers if anybody is familiar with this comic book i fucking love you if you are not you need to stop living under a rock and we need to start talking about comic books more often um battle chasers came out from a gentleman i need to get his name i always forget the names no but essentially what happened was is uh this comic book came out it got outside funding and the comic book is very uh japanese influence but it's mm. it's written in like an american style um so it did really well. It only got 10 issues and the entire like compendium that they sell is hundreds of dollars like nice. for a copy in English. Uh, but it's really cheap in Spanish if you want it that way. Yeah, you were, that was the one you were telling me about that yeah, you were like looking for and you were I was about like, to snag. Ooh, man, if I could... Ooh, girl, you have no idea. Yeah. If only I could find one. Um, but essentially, the gentleman that made this, he finally got the rights to his own issue again, which was pretty cool. And then he started cranking out... Um, I think he always did fan art and everything else. He's at conventions. He's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Fuck, I'm trying to get his name. I should have been more prepared for this. Gosh, dropping the ball. I'm going to take it over from you. Totally if dropping the ball. Do you have it in front of you? Well, not his name, but well, a different game. I got it. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. Joe. I'm probably going to say this. So wrong. I'm so sorry. Joe. Maderia. We're going to go with that one. So it sounds cool. pretty good. Um, but what Joe did is he was pretty much the guy that did most of the stuff. And he is a uh, visionary comic artist. Um, people just call him Joe Mad for short. Um, and then what happened here was, uh, the two of these guys are vigil founding members and they were the creating and shipping for, uh, Darksiders and Darksiders 2. Oh, nice. You wonder why I love this fucking game yeah, already. Right. Um, but it is very JRPG. So essentially the gameplay style of it is going to be top down on the field map. It's going to look very much like a Diablo map that you're sifting through, Nice. but it has a turn-based battle structure. Oh, hell yeah. So walking around doing all the other stuff, you run into something. I'm not sure if it's random or if you walk into the enemies you see on the map, it begins a turn-based battle. The turn-based battles in animations are flawless. It's everything you would expect from a moving comic book, which is why I am already fucking sold. It is turn-based. It's JRPG-esque, and then it's got some Diablo elements to it as well. Um, I'll probably post a link to this or get something going there for you. I'm just going to show Brandon this cute little gif really quick. You can kind of see what's going on. <laughs> right? Gives him the low blow, huh? Main character here is called Garrison, um, which was also one of the main characters in the book. Um, but essentially, he's just a fucking badass. It reminds me very much of uh, Guts from Berserker. Yeah. Or Berserk. Um, so that alone like, should already tell you what's going on with this guy and the way he's trying to go with everything. Yeah. So it's called Battle Chasers Night War. Oh, God. I'm going to get the name wrong, too. Watch. Do it. Nope. Battle yep. Chasers Night War. Uh, I've been filing nice. this thing a whole bunch. Uh, they were at E3. I missed them and I felt bad. They're going to be at Gamescom. Um, and then also, too, they do get a few. Um, if you did do a Kickstarter with them, you got uh, some exclusive backings. Um, like if you were to back them on Kickstarter, you got uh, the Chaos Cedar or Chaos Eater from Darksiders. Mm -hmm. uh, the sword that war swung around. Yeah. So you get that for Garrison, which is pretty cool. Nice. Um, if you didn't, it's fine. You can still go fund them other ways, which is pretty sick. Um, but Battle Chasers Night War definitely should be on anybody's radar. We'll try to talk to Airship Syndicate and see if they want to hang out for a bit on Skype or something. Um, I'd like for them to tell you more about their game. I mainly want you guys to go look at this shit like right now. Uh, Such a good the game, game that I would say look out for. And it's technically out. What is it? Um, it's called Cryptarch. In. With I know a, nothing with a K other. at the end of it. Um, so it's actually in technically like early access that came out October seventh. Okay. So you can actually pick up the game. It's a lot like um, we Happy Fuse doing right now, where the game is released, but they're kind of going through and fixing it, patching it, making it more beautiful. Kind of like the green light thing with Steam, almost right? exactly. Okay. Yeah. So that it's actually a Steam game. 
Oh, that makes sense. Exactly. So that's what it is. So Cryptarch, it basically is a, it's got the same style as like Axiom Verge where you're getting that kind of that darker sci-fi to it with like living machines. Okay. So like uh, bio biomechanical. Yeah. Okay. But it plays, it's a little bit more, I'm trying to think of something that plays like this. It looks like the play style. I haven't played it yet, but it looks like the same play style as, uh, God, what's that game that? I have no idea. Fucking GameStop just put out. Oh, uh, Voice of the Sea? Song of the Deep. Song of the Deep. I don't know why that made me think of it. But like, sorry. I totally you're little, butchered that shit. You're a little ship that's moving through space, and you're just kind of flying around doing goofy shit, but like mm-hmm. the, uh, the combat around you looks really big. Here, I'll just kind of show you, so nobody else is going to be able to see this, but that way you kind of at least get like a sense of what I'm saying. So definitely it's got that, that same feel of Axiom Verge. Dude, that looks just like Galaxy. Yeah. Except... Yeah. more 2d based than anything else. exactly so that that game is one i would say definitely go i think you can get the 15 dollar um access to it which gives you the early access but it, it will give you the full game when it launches it does have uh, co-op local co-op it does controller support everything like that so that's the one i would say especially if you're nice. into those darker undertones um, in a game and exactly everything else. yeah i'd say that's that's my that's game nice. like and then that. the one i want is uh i am satsuna but i haven't picked that because 40 dollars we might talk about that later. What's a good price for an indie game? Yeah, that might be next show. Maybe. But in the meantime, I think that's pretty much it for that's this. All, this is ran about almost a, an hour and a half. Almost an hour and a half, you guys. So it's really good. I got a lot to edit. <laughs> I, I really hope you guys enjoyed this podcast. So this is the first one. Once again, we will be doing this bi-weekly. So we'll yep. do it every Saturday. We will shoot for 12. Every bi-weekly Saturday. Yeah, every bi-weekly. That's probably good to say. I so what is it? So what's next Saturday from now? I don't know, two weeks from today. It's a while from now. Yeah. Either way, you guys, please subscribe to the channel. It does a lot for us. Go to the YouTube. You can watch all of our past shows there. You can check out our podcast. You can check out our live streams right on Twitch. Just go to past broadcasts. Yep, yep. Tons of fun. This is Independent Podcast brought to you by Fat Island Gaming. I'm Brandon. That's Zach. And we will catch you guys next time. Bye.